Hello everyone, and welcome to my legendary starting guide for the Dark Elves. Specifically, we'll be focusing today on Nagarot, and to see how far you can get with the Legendary E campaign for this faction. This guide will focus primarily around the early game, and seeing like the best actions you can do to basically guarantee yourself a strong start, so to make your mid game and late game much easier. Malkith, in general, is a very powerful lord that you'll be utilizing for high DPS with his spells right off the bat. Chillwind is very powerful in the early game against the Skaven and the Norskins, and eventually you'll be focusing on other factions. If you are looking for the easiest legendary campaign in Warhammer 2 Total War, Nagaron is the faction for you. Though you see that there's a couple negative um, effects on the top right here, they really don't matter to uh, Malekith, because uh, in all honesty, leveling up your other generals is fine. That's not a problem. And uh, it's, loyalty is not really that much of an issue, because if you do win with your primary army and with a lot of battles, you will have no issues whatsoever. Now, having that plus 30 diplomatic relationship with the Cult of Pleasure is huge, though. Eventually... With this faction, it's all about a race to secure as much land to the south of your empire as possible. Eventually, you'll meet up with the Cult of Pleasure, and then essentially you divide your land. Cult of Pleasure will take over land to the south, while you take over land to the north. The Cult of Pleasure you want as a strong military ally to deal with all the legendary AI factions in Lustra or into the south. Fighting the Lizardmen is a pain, and personally, I hate late Lizardmen fighting, but the Cult of Pleasure will do that job all by themselves. Which, for you, it has a, it's actually a pretty big advantage. You can focus on the Skaven, the Norska tribes, and the other Dark Elf factions. Occasionally, you'll be, be dealing with some High Elves, but that shouldn't be a problem to deal with. And once you get to the mid-game, I mean... The big advantage that the Dark Elves have is the fact that they have crossbows early game. You can fight chaos without even breaking a sweat, thanks to having early game crossbow dark shards. But, not to delay this any further, let's get right into the campaign. And we'll get into details for every specific move, so you guys have you can take advantage of the time, because... At the beginning of the game, it's all about a race of getting to the Southlands before the Cult of Pleasure. Okay. We're starting off here, and I'll give you guys a map overview of what essentially you're focusing on. The whole goal here is to race as quickly to the South as possible before the Cult of Pleasure steals that area from you. The Skaven army will be your primary focus right off the bat, and we'll be trying our best to destroy them as quickly as possible. The Skaven have a colonization army that they're building, and they'll try to be going west. Haggraf is to your south, and the game wants you to do a non-aggression with them, but it's not worth it. You can gain more economic power by securing the territory, and then heading southeast to fight Clan Karkon. If you could take over those territories before the Cult of Pleasure, you secure yourself having a stronger foothold in the north. Eventually, some people might suggest a confederation, but in all honesty, I wouldn't bother. With your main army, set it inside your capital. If you leave your army outside the capital, there's a chance that the Skaven army can attack and do an ambush attack on your small force. Choose the bottom tree skill. So you can go, because you'll be going down towards growth and stuff. You'll be securing two non-aggression trees to your east and to your west. These factions are not really bothering you in your path of conquest. And securing a non-aggression pact is actually good. Eventually, later on, these, these factions could be good trading partners. As your power grows, so will... Uh, the faction's distrust with you, so it's going to be harder to secure a trade deal later on. The Skaven army will always move away, because it's going to it's go into a fortifying stance. But the thing is, with this campaign, 
do not bother going after that army because it changes the min the AI's uh, reaction to you. Like there is a colonization army just west of this of that army that's fortified up there. Can it be beaten? Yes, of course. However, then Skaven do does this like scorched earth or guerrilla warfare strat where they just fall back. Secure this city right off the bat. And the rats and the Skaven are guaranteed to do some type of ambush strategy here. You'll see here in a second. You'll suffer almost no casualties, nothing whatsoever. But the Skaven will realize that they're not in friendly territory and they're going to fall back to the city just north of them. Continue building a mix of what I just did of like dark shards and spearmen and essentially you're going to be building these units throughout the beginning. With Malekith, invest one point into Chill Wind. That cooldown will be very useful for the upcoming battle, because the upcoming battle is going to be huge. And I'll go over it with you guys, and we'll in detail to see, like, guarantee you the best uh, scenarios. Because there are a couple of ways to do this battle, and uh, applying as many casualties as possible is necessary. Since you have no light cap units, it's not going to be easy to actually run down any any uh, stragglers. Now, in this situation, we're du I'm double checking how many settlements the Skaven have left. They have two, so I know there's one to my west, one to my north. Those the colonization army is somewhere to my west here. I don't see them, but I know they are there. There's a chance they might be settling deeper into the Iron Mountains, but not yet. I'm placing my army right there on purpose. I know I'm surrounded by enemies, but I want them to attack me. That Skaven stack is going to attack me, and then like another couple side armies are going to attack me as well. And I wanted them that to happen. This perf this exact movement will force all the Sk all these Skaven stacks to attack. Now, whether or not you want to fight an ambush or not is completely up to you. Personally, I would strongly suggest trying to get like a normal standard deployment and not an ambush. It depends on whether or not you want a more of a challenge, but I strongly suggest getting a normal battle. The Skaven have a good chance to actually ambush your army every time, but there's also a pretty decent chance that you can get a standard battle deployment. And against such overwhelming numbers, you honestly do want to have a standard deployment. You have a much better chance and a guaranteed map that will appear every single time you do this battle. And the map actually is to your advantage completely. You have two strategies. Well, a couple of strategies you can do. There's a natural mountain you can actually use to your advantage, and you can also rush the enemy's reinforcements. However, the reinforcement army is made is compromised entirely of Skaven slaves. These slaves can be destroyed and routed very quickly. You can position army right here in the corner, and as the reinforcements come in, you could just slaughter them right there and then. But that's not the goal. You could do it. It's possible, but it's just not worth it because the army will, uh, will break formation. You will cause. It will, you will do enough morale damage, but you'll not do enough damage to the unit itself. See, the goal here of this battle is to damage that Skaven slave force as much as possible. If you are successful in, like, doing some serious casualties to that Skaven slave force, it prevents that the, that army from actually colonizing another city deeper in the Iron Mountains, which in turn is, like, essentially wasting your time. You also have to deal with the main force, but using the mountain to your left, you can position your archers in the back, your spearmen, and just make, like, a, a sea formation with your artillery in the back. The main Skaven army will come up through you across this uh, valley, and the Skaven slave force will appear to your left. Okay, there'll be two scenario- there'll be uh, two drop-ins of Skaven units behind your lines, but being surrounded by enemies makes the unit route very quickly. Though you gotta be very careful on legendary difficulty, I would strongly suggest having your archers shoot at them, even if they do rod very quickly, just in case they recover the morale. You gotta be very careful with that legendary uh, leadership bonus. 
Having at least one unit of spearmen behind your lines at the very beginning would probably be a good idea in case to deal with the underground ability that the Skaven have. It doesn't. It barely does any damage though, so they, they just use it way too quickly. Once that is over, you can go ahead and set up your formation again. It's best to keep Malekith like very close to the left flank though, so he can respond very quickly to Skaven's slave force that's coming from the left, and to deal with the uh, any other front lines. The best time to use Malekith's chill wind ability is when they're when the enemies are fighting your spearmen on the front line, that's when you actually utilize in for a maximum effect. As for your artillery, I mean I was thinking whether or not I should use scatter shot on getting some units, but it's probably better just to use armor piercing rounds and just damage the general as much as you can. You also have a on the side you have a spell that's a, a snare ability. An AoE snare which honestly it's perfect for your archers. You use your artillery ch uh, Malkith's Chillwind, plus your archers, so you could do massive damage to any unit you snare. I wouldn't worry too much about damaging the Skaven main army. That army is already dead. It's not. It's, it's not really that important. At this stage, I'm deciding like when I should actually use the snare, and I kind of want the, uh, the enemy to get a little closer for maximum effect. So I'm just waiting for you for now. If that Skaven slave force on the left like just charges my left flank, I'll just wait until they actually hit the front line so when they group up I can use Chillwind. Since I got an excess amount of magic, I just throw I just shot one Chillwind at him. Use the snare here and just like focus fire my archers. Have the artillery shoot at him too. The Skaven slip the Skaven army is moving to my right flank, and that's not that much of a problem. I could just make my right flank pull back a little bit more. Better focus that Skaven Slinger unit. So it doesn't do too much damage to the spearmen. What's the really strange thing is that since we're doing so much damage to the Skaven army, they're not even reaching my front line before they're already routing. But then again, that's what happens when you have a lot of crossbowmen right off the bat. I did think this flanking attack was interesting though, but. The majority of the army was already destroyed before they even hit the lines. For the early game, you could just use this strategy nonstop against the Skaven, the Norskins, even the Dark Elves. The majority of these factions do not have like any light cav units, though the Norskins do have uh, what you might call it, war dogs. Just make a bigger box with your spearmen right off the bat. Thing is, I could attack the uh, the generals and like destroy their morale, but the focus for this battle is not really to win the battle, but to actually do as much damage to the units as possible. This battle is not really about winning it quickly; it's about as inflicting as many casualties as possible, so you prevent the enemies from replenishing their units very quickly and then colonizing another city deep in the Iron Mountains. With this bonus, uh, since we've caused so much, so many kills, we got ourselves a bonus in DPS and morale and I mean it's just a turkey shoot at this stage. Once you think you, you've done enough kills, you could then just focus on the leaders. Right here, what you're seeing is what you would always want to do with Malekith. You see the enemy hit your front line, get Malekith to flank here, and then use Chillwind on the army. This It's a perfect ability to use against enemies that are for any other faction. Die, 
Once the battle is essentially over, victory is yours with very minimal casualties. This I wouldn't say this is like the difficult battle, but uh, if you let the enemy ambush you and you don't get a position like a such an opportunistic position like this, you you will suffer some heavy casualties. I mean, without a doubt. Being surrounded by the Skaven is going to be pretty hard on yourself. And if you don't, if you don't, if you, eh, well, it really depends. If you get ambushed, you could try it, but honestly, just go for a standard deployment if you can. The Skaven force took, Slave force took a couple of casualties. Pretty significant, about half, they lost about half their units for each unit. And now they'll all run back to their own areas. If you didn't inflict enough casualties to the Skaven Slave Force, they're they're gonna recover very quickly, and then move deeper into the Iron Mountains. Now you're probably thinking, what's the problem? Then like, what's wrong? The problem the thing is, it's a race at the moment. You need to get your your main army attack the south as soon as possible. I'm giving self myself Whirlwind very early on, so I can have feel like a decent AOE damage spell. It'll be very useful for the the quests and against any large armies. And you'll be fighting Dark Elves here very soon, so it's very useful to have. Once you're at this stage, give Malkith his 10% movement speed bonus for the map, and. <laughs> you could also, if you've taken too many casualties, go ahead and like combine your troops, dis disband some troops, and then just order new ones, since you now have secured the entire province. As for your tech tree, work your way down, you got yourself a little bit of growth, and give yourself public order. You need the public order really badly, especially on legendary difficulty, due to the fact that you have such a massive negative bonus. For your capital, build your resource building. It will get, generate gold and give you a discount on future buildings. Very useful to have. And as for your as for the third building, go ahead and give yourself public order. Normally, I wouldn't suggest uh, building a tier three building in your capital because it's limited. It's just you're just limiting it. But for the Dark Elves, for Negarond. Go ahead and go for it. Getting that artillery as soon as possible is good to have. As for an edict, choose the edict that gives you a, a discount, that gives you growth and a discount on building production. It's very good to have in the early game. Plus that uh, resource building you're, you're getting, you're giving yourself a massive discount on future buildings. The Skaven are still replenishing their units near that city, which is perfect news. If you want to double check whether or not the Skaven actually expanded to the west, you could check the Diplomacy tab. Here for a second I was deciding whether or not I should I, should I build a tradable resource building or not, but in all honesty it's better to go for growth instead. The faster you can these cities can get to tier 3 the better, because you want to get these uh, wall the defensive walls up as soon as possible. Because eventually you're going to go to war with that. Norsk faction to the north of you. As with my main army, I just put him right next to the enemy city. Well, I'm just double checking the diplomacy tab to see how many settlements they have left. They have one, which is perfect. Normally, about this stage, you would check, you could see if they've expanded west or not. Since they took heavy casualties, they didn't expand, they didn't make the run for that city. What could be annoying is that on legendary difficulty, the Skaven can actually build so quickly they could have like tier two defenses, tier three defenses. I mean, at the uh, the city walls and advanced units, and it's just not worth it because you're not going to colonize this area because it's on. It's like a you can see those orange icons next to the city names. It's just not a. It's not an early game area to go for for the Dark Elves. There's too many public order penalties, the cost penalties, it's just not worth dealing with at the start of the game. You can auto this battle and win, but you will suffer some very heavy casualties. 
and I thought to myself, you know what? Instead, I'll chase after the army. I'll back up my force that's I'm right next to it, and I'll attack the the entrenched army. The entrenched army immediately retreats, which is perfect. Which means they can't support the city. So there you go, a much better auto resolve, and I suffer a lot less casualties. You can go ahead and loot and occupy this uh, area, because we're not going to stay here. Since the Skaven have no settlements left, they're just going to do a suicide run onto your uh, castle, guaranteed. If they did have a settlement to the one more settlement to the west, they would just retreat to that. And you're, and the bad thing is, you just open up a second front for the Norskin faction to the on the Chaos Wasteland to your north. Predictable, the Skaven attack your ta your uh, castle, and then it's it's just a slaughter. Go ahead, and just auto resolve, and just keep uh, enslaving the armies. I wish Trollinx was just finishing them off, though. You don't have to give the Skaven a chance to actually rebuild. Because trying to chase them around these Iron Mountains will waste a lot of time. And that's the time that you really need to expand to the south. Unfortunately, in my campaign, I was a little bit unlucky. I had the, uh, the Norska tribe to my north declared war on me early on. It doesn't happen all the time, but it's not that much of an issue. You're noticing also a rebellion in my main province. That's also not much of an issue at all. Personally, I would strongly suggest let that rebellion build up and let them siege your capital neck around. With your with Malkith, you have the Skaven threat is gone, and then you could just build up your main army as soon as possible. Build up your spearmen, build up your dark shards. And then just get behind the rebellion. Let the rebels attack the capital. Don't fight the rebels on open ground, because they do have some. They do have some advanced units. They have some light cav. They have harpies, corsairs. They have some strong units. And if you can combine the garrison of your capital with your main army, you can auto the battle and take almost no casualties and gain a lot of experience and slaves for your economy. I'm just moving close to. I'm just wasting a couple turns letting that rebellion build up. Double checking replenishment rates, seeing who I sh who should I replace, who I shouldn't. I could build swordsmen, but uh, in all honesty, it doesn't really matter. This composition is pretty strong for the early game. Upgrading my growth building, upgrading the resource building for better discounts for construction. The main goal, the good thing about the Iron Mountains is that when the rebe the, uh, the rebels come out, they will actually not destroy the capital, they will actually secure it. So it's actually a, it's actually a good thing, because uh, the Norska tribes don't care for rebels. They just, in all honesty, ignore them. There's only one path that the uh, Norskans will come from, and that's the, your, more, your most northern village in your region. Once you get a garrison up there, you can guarantee that your north will be safe. There's also some strict. There's a, at this point in the game, there is a bit of RNG involved in some cases. Some reasons, sometimes the AI will will attack you much sooner, but sometimes they won't. Just let the rebels siege the city as soon as possible. Now, there's also a, a big critical point for this stage as well. The beastmen about this turn, about these turns right now, the beastmen will actually be running through your territory, and they're heading towards the faction, the dark elf faction to your south, Hagraf. I do apologize. I thought I was saying it wrong, but they are coming down, and they are going to get close to Hagraf. And Hagraf is going to send out a stack to actually attack the beastmen. This is perfect. You essentially, it's it's like uh, two birds, one stone scenario. Hagraf will defeat the beastmen, and once their army is wounded after fighting, 
you then attack Hagraf and then attack their main capital. Hagraf uh, and Dark Elf actually to your south has two stacks. Generally they have two stacks. One, one of which you will be able to defeat very quickly since they're wounded. And the second will, is located somewhere randomly in their territory. If the secondary stack is not in their capital, then you secure the capital as quickly as possible and then work your way down. You'll have one more epic battle, like stack up versus stack battle, against Hagraf, and if you win, you essentially have secured your southern uh, territories. Once we secure with the capital of the Hagraf, I'll show you the reasoning of like what's so important. In this in this campaign, the rebels didn't actually secure, didn't actually siege Nacaron. Instead, they uh, the rebels chased after the Hagra Hagraf uh, stack, and they lost. Which is honestly fine by me. The only reason the rebels didn't attack me is because I was in ambush stance. That's what gave me the edge in that battle. Seeing how wounded the <laughs> that army is. The complete opposite thing happened. They fought the rebels, so they took casualties, and then they fought the beastmen, and the beastmen won. That doesn't generally happen. Most of the time, it's the other way around. You defeat the rebels, and the beastmen and are defeated by Hagraf. But of course, there is a bit of RNG ness in all these campaigns. So, the further you go, you go in, the harder it is to be predictable every single time because I've done about I've done about uh, 10 to 15 legendary campaign to see like what how much changes what's what actually changes and what's the big difference in this scenario you should be able I like at around this time you should be able to attack Hagraf's capital and there shouldn't be a garrison in there but for the purpose of this tutorial, we'll let it continue on, and I'll show you exactly what you're going after. I'll be also covering and showing off my endgame units to see, to show you like what I actually, what kind of composition I actually used for the late game. Since uh, the Norskins declared war on me, I had to build up an army much, much sooner, and I was going to build some like dark shards and some standard spearmen. I'll show I'll show before I end the early game footage here. I'll show off uh, a battle against like overwhelming odds against the Norskins, and it just proves to show you that you really shouldn't have much to worry about as the Dark Elves because your early game units is just extremely reliable and very powerful. Armor piercing units, right off the bat, is <laughs> well. Let's be honest. I'll I'll say it. It's pretty overpowered. With my main army, I'm just waiting for the uh, stack in the capital to leave. So this stack, at this stage, it's just basically a time waster. The Norskins should be attacking very soon. Only from the north, though. They won't attack me from the west. Well, the great thing is they generally ignore the, uh, the rebel castle. So... That means my north front's secure. Now, whether or not I should expand eastward, northeast? Uh, you can. It's not a problem. I, th I think that's where generally the game wants you to f like focus on early game. But the only reason is to secure as much south territory before the Cult of Pleasure. Because the Cult of Pleasure on Legendary Difficulty will always, and I mean always, be the dominant power in this region. It will secure territory very, very quickly. Now that the uh, Hagraf army has moved, secure their capital, and then you will work your way down. There are n enough beastmen moving around the area that Hagrafs will they'll be moving out very often to actually like protect themselves. The campaign skills I invested uh, a couple skills down in the ca main campaign so to get more slaves and more post battle loot. That's, that'll, that'll be your general income. Your main income. 
With that Mac around, I was focusing on getting slave slaves, improving the port and to generate as much money as possible in the early game. I'm taking a hit in financially due to the beastmen in my area, but in all honesty, they're really good at luring out dark elf armies, so I can understand the situation much better. They might put a little bit of chaos around you, but I wouldn't worry about it too much. With your tech tree, focus, continue to focus down on the bottom tree. It improves your your overall growth of your empire. Now when you approach these areas, go into ambush stance. Because if you don't, the AI will see the threat and they'll send their stack to and garrison them in that village. There's also a decent chance that you can catch the army off guard. And with this way you'll essentially trickle down, destroy Haggraf, and then secure their valuable resource. This region, their capital, Haggraf, they have a special building which generates money and it generates two tradable resources. Eventually, when you get like tier four, you can also it also gives like uh, bonuses for certain units. This territory is hands down worth getting very early on. Though this might change later on, though this is like like a guide for the Dark House right now to attack this region early. But eventually, when the Tomb Kings are released later this month. I mean, it's going to get pretty brutal because you're going to have to fortify this region very quickly from the west. This is what you get for getting a tier 4 building. Money, tradable resources, upkeep, experience. Like, securing this very early on will give you the advantage you need. You get a port and you get a money generation landmark. Hands down worth it. As for upgrading your units... Eventually, as you secure your empire, these two provinces, eventually you're going to start, you'll secure both provinces, and then you're going to start steadily replacing your Dark Shard crossbowmen with shades. And eventually, your spearmen, you will replace them with black guards. Not all of them, but with a, a certain amount. Tier 3, with the resource building, and uh, now we'll have even a bigger discount. All in all, this is like the best way to do for your campaign. I've done a, a number of examples, but it's all about like expanding south and to encounter the cult of pleasure as soon as possible. Because if you don't run into the cult of pleasure soon, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to be like donating a lot of gold, so they're on your uh, good stance with you. Even though you have that, that plus thirty. Diplomatic relationship with them, it's um, you're still gonna have to like gift them gold to keep good relations with them. And if and sometimes my people might think like oh, it's just not worth uh, giving them free gold, but having a massive dark elf military ally to your south is extremely beneficial. Like it's like personally, I would fight the dark elves the well. well not Dark Elves, the Lizardmen, because they could be extremely annoying to deal with. Like, in all honesty, like, the, the Primal Instincts and the the uh, T-Rex the spam or the Triceratops spam, the AI could be pretty annoying, a legendary, so... My, my personal suggestion would be to have the Cult of Pleasure deal with them, because they they almost always win. Actually, what am I saying? They do always win. The Cult of Pleasure will always beat the Lizardmen in the South Campaign on Legendary. The only thing that might really annoy the Cult of Pleasure is when the High Elves to your east, Lothurn, when they attack you, that's when it can get pretty annoying because they can secure some territory. But the High Elves only go after the, uh, the Ritual Sites, or they go after you. It generally is not, not that... Uh, significant. 
Now in this battle, it looks like I'm at a massive disadvantage against this Norska tribe. But um, what gives me hope is the fact that these guys don't have trolls to storm through my lanes, which is great. They do outnumber me heavily with the uh, the Chaos Marauders. One War Dog unit and two Marauder Calf. In all honesty, my plan was to like just go into a corner and just like set up spear formation and just have my crossbowmen do the job. But he, <laughs> at, on this map, I, the, it wouldn't work out because the corners of the map are covered in forests. Which uh, is a bit of a disadvantage for crossbows. So, I would put my back against the wall here and use that to my advantage. Have I have two light cav units, so that's what I would primarily use to actually do, like, change the course of this battle. There's also a good tip here for late game battles. Eventually you'll be fighting vortex armies. And there'll be uh, chaos guys with like hell cannons and stuff. Since uh, your light cav units can go outside your deployment range, have those light cav units on the far, far sides of the map. Let your main garrison get slaughtered, but have your light cav attack the hell cannons when they're undefended. You would fi you'll find it very beneficial for your epic battles later on that the the enemy do not have their artillery with them because hell cannons can cause serious damage. In this scenario I knew I, I can't really secure a corner so I just put my back against the wall here. F found a very good open area for my crossbowmen and that will be my strategy like a box formation right off the bat. I am heavily outnumbered I don't expect to win in a uh, standard encounter. Get these guys in a position. Have the spearmen guard my flanks because I'm expecting the war dogs and the marauder cav to hit my sides while my swordsmen will hold the front line. Though they shouldn't be able to hold the front line very long. I'm trying to make this box formation as compact as possible. My leader in general won't be of that that's significant, and I don't want to expose him to him dying too early on. Someone did suggest like to use like leaders to like hold the front line, but uh, if I if my leader gets damaged too heavily in this battle, it'll be very problematic. But the thing, good thing about the corners being covered in trees are is that my light cav units could just hide there for, until the battle actually occurs. The best time to ever use to do like, like set off an ambush, is when the enemy is engage like, engaging your troops on the front line. Let them, let the enemy hit my front lines and then I'll attack. I'm noticing them; they're already flanking with their units to the side, so I position that one crossbow to deal with that unit. I was a little bit worried whether or not that Marauder unit would spot them, but thankfully they didn't. I was primarily focusing on the the Marauder Horse Calf because they actually have ranged attacks. If you get rid of them early on with your crossbows, which they should, uh, your Spearmen shouldn't take any more damage. They're also pretty annoying to deal with on Legendary. Even if you slaughter that Horseman, they'll come back due to the leg Legendary uh, buff they have. You would probably think, like, maybe I should send out the cav right now, but I can't. On my left flank, those units are still moving up to hit my front line, so I have to wait. If I move out the light cav right now, those two units on the left would actually try to fight them, and it defeats the whole purpose of uh, hitting them in the back with that calf. Now that I see that the units are actually engaging with my left flank, that's the perfect time to actually get your calf moving. In your campaigns, you there's a chance that you won't even have to do this battle because it's very unpredictable whether or not the Norsekins attack you or not. 
<laughs> you can already see that the Marauder horse calves are coming back, but it shouldn't be much of a problem. A good charge in the back with these two light calf units against all those Chaos Marauders should cause more than enough damage in morale and death. There you go. The kill buff. Mass, mass, uh, broken, mass breaking. Their leader, I didn't, I did ignore the leader for a bit. But then again, like some people say, like, rush killing leader, or do not. I honestly want as many dead chaos marauders as possible to prevent them from attacking again too quickly. I then I then later here send my lord to attack. For a second, I honestly thought I had like a melee lord. I, I completely forgot I had a uh, a crossbow lord. Though it looks like you are winning very heavily here, you got to be very careful on legendary difficulty. Just have have your units hold their defense formations and just let your crossbowmen do the work because. There's a good chance that the enemy, a legendary, will recover their morale and then just charge you again. And since you break your formations, your defensive formations, you're putting yourself at a at risk. Yeah, you can see all these bro you can see all these broken units regrouping, but it, since I focused on the enemy's leader, it broke morale and and the battle was won. I mean, if this isn't proof of how strong the Dark Elves are in the early game, I don't know what is. It's just, the, the crossbows are just amazing to have in the early game. We'll be back. Not to mention, like, Dark Shards with, like, the crossbows with the shields. It's pretty powerful. It can be, it's an easy counter to, to the High Elves. As for how good it is against other Dark Elves, eh, it, may, it doesn't really matter that much. I mean, either way, the crossbows are armor piercing weaponry missiles, so even if you have a shield, the, the crossbow will do some significant damage. In general, with, with this many casualties, they, the Norskins won't attack anytime soon, and you can also build up your forces. Most of the time, most of your campaigns, you will have walls, and that will completely discourage a Norska invasion in general. So you can focus more on other enemies and such. But this was a secondary battle example. I'll show you guys here in the late game of some other scenarios. And to see, like, to show you what to go after, what you're essentially building up to get. Like in general, it, it looks. It may, I make the campaign look a little difficult, but in all honesty, it is definitely by far the easiest legendary campaign. I got a black arc in the coast there, and it's just chilling. And you can see what I mean about the the cult of pleasure. The cult of pleasure was like making confederations with all the other dark elves in the region. I secured some of the territory in the south, and the cult of pleasure took everything else. The High Elves will always focus in securing that uh, ritual site. And they're a bit of annoyance, but that's really your only threat, other than the Vortex armies. You could have a. Building a Black Art near capital is always good to have, because then. I think of Shogun 2, uh, two Fall of the Samurai's like, ships that would provide artillery support. That's what the Black Art does for when you're playing battles. My main army was compromised of Malekith, a sorceress, so essentially two chill winds, two blade winds, four black guards, four shades with great swords, four shades with dual weapons, two artillery pieces, and four hydras. I probably wonder, like, why do I not have dragons or stuff? In all honesty, it just wasn't necessary. I mean, the hydras are more than enough. The shades do so much 
DPS that I don't even worry about it. And I just build my War Hydras from Clan Karkon. They gain experience. The special building gives them experience, lowers the upkeep, and in general I save money. Malekith is also, I have also leveled him up to be a war leader, and in like many stack battles I get like 30,000 or more gold. With this build, I mean, you have essentially nothing to worry about. The Cult of Pleasure will continue its campaign to the south, and it will win hands down without even trying. The Skaven, the Lizardmen, they can try fighting the Cult of Pleasure, but the Cult of Pleasure engine will always win. But you will have to gift the Cult of Pleasure a decent amount of money to keep them in your good graces. You, you do not want them. Her as an enemy. Like, like, confederating with the Cult of Pleasure is also doesn't seem like worth doing because you have to also deal with all of that chaos to deal with it. It's just like, uh, you have to build all these temples to fight corru chaos corruption, and it's a bit of a pain. They're much better at being an ally than anything. And at the very least, you don't have to worry about your south campaign. Once you deal with the Norskins, you've secured, both you and the Cult of Pleasure have secured all these other Dark Elf regions. All you really have to worry about is Ulthalan, or the High Elves to the east. Now what I suggest doing an invasion, that entirely depends upon you. Personally, I wanted to destroy the, the Norskins to the north, so they didn't annoy my northeastern regions. And that was it. The only reason you see like all like all these ruins to the northwest and these dwarves to the east, that's primarily due to me consolidating all my forces to my capital due to the vortex armies. I was defending the ritual sites against the final vortex army wave, and essentially every week I held my ground pretty well. I wouldn't suggest moving north and securing those regions as soon as possible, though. Because the bad thing about the Chaos Wastelands, the you can only build tier 2 defenses, which means you can't build walls. So, those settlements will fall very quickly against the Vortex Armies. Like, Vortex Armies, like, like they can spawn 8 stacks in one region. It's be You're better off just consolidating all your primary stacks close to your capital, and then move from there. As for my buildings, just showing off my buildings of what I build in Nakarond. In all honesty, I probably could have better ones. But, uh, in case my other villages fall apart, it's a good balance of different things. For both holding economics, building units, and building basic units. Getting that artillery as soon as possible is very nice to have. Is it as good as, like, uh... Playing as a Skaven, not as much, but still pretty good. You would focus on your campaign skills, go for your leadership skills, and uh, focus pretty heavy on your magic, because Malekith's magic is, well, let's be honest, it's pretty powerful to have. And whatever your composition is, focus on that, on that as well. You could focus on him being, like, a war leader or something like that, but, I mean... This, these bonuses right now, which I'm going over through, they're so powerful, like, there's no reason to not choose that. On uh, Legendary Difficulty, securing public order with the Dark Elves is pretty easy. You won't be dealing with many rebellions. Because you have such very powerful public order buildings right off the bat. And then you, you could just fight, you could fight the Vortex armies, you could fight these... The intervention armies defeat them, and you get it's basically payday with every army you defeat. So, in general, the Dark Elf campaign is very easy, and uh, if you're looking to beat it, this is the best can. This is the guide for it. So, I do hope this guide was helpful for you guys. If you have any additional questions, be sure to put it in the comments below, and I'll respond to it as quickly as possible. I hope you guys enjoy the video, and I'll see you next time.